Could you imagine? Despite the setbacks, the build must continue as fast as possible. Now they can begin mounting the engines, some of the most expensive parts of the whole aircraft. Together, four of these giant Rolls-Royce Trent 900s cost nearly 36 million pounds, a quarter of the cost of the plane. Back in May 2004, the engine flew for the first time. It was bolted onto a much smaller airliner, dwarfing its other engines. Weighing over six tons, the Trent 900 can produce up to 35 tons of thrust at full power, burning a gallon of fuel every four seconds. These early tests proved the engine at altitude, but there's a much, much tougher test to come. Here in Hucknall, Nottinghamshire, a second test engine will soon be a smoking ruin. Deliberately destroyed as part of a dramatic yet vital safety test. It's an important time for the entire project. And as engineer Hilary Barton travels to the test, she admits to some nerves. I must say I've got a few butterflies at the moment, but basically um, everybody's done the preparation and it's just now a matter of, of getting on and doing the test. But obviously before the, the engine starts, you're sitting there just kind of hoping it all go well, but uh, just really waiting for it to happen now. Every few years, a fan blade will break in a jet engine somewhere in the world, a rare but violent event that must not put lives in danger. At the root of the coloured blade is an explosive charge. With the engine at full power, it will be detonated, releasing the blade with tremendous force. Whatever happens, no large debris can be allowed to burst out of the engine casing. If it did, it could do serious damage to the rest of the aircraft. From the safety of a room 200 metres away, watching on video, 25 key personnel are waiting. In the split second the blade is released, the casing must successfully contain an enormous impact. It is a very, this is a very violent um, test. This thing is spinning around, it's at full power, so you've got uh, the forces on, on the blade uh, are quite, quite significant. It's like having a, a locomotive uh, hanging on, on, that, on that blade. So you're obviously having to contain the energy of, of that system. So there's a lot of energy involved in the design and containment of the, of the blade. The engine is run for five minutes, so final checks can be made. With such an expensive test, nothing can be allowed to go wrong. High-speed film cameras are used to analyse the action and at last the throttles are opened and the engine brought to its full awesome power. This is what it feels like to be inside a building 200 metres away from a £9 million blade-off event. <laughs> blade-off testing is normally top secret, but for the first time, Rolls-Royce have released this footage. Although the engine was totally destroyed, the fan case did its job and no large lumps of metal were ejected. I feel very relieved, obviously it's gone well, we've had a good test and it's all credit to the guys and yes, we've, we've, got, we've got a successful test under a belt, so I uh, feel relieved and really pleased. 
By December, the plane is finally about to leave the equipping hall in France. Airbus are trying everything to make back time, even if it means working over Christmas. With the grand unveiling just five weeks away, the next giant task is to paint the massive machine. In yet another vast hangar, working over the holidays, 90 painters descend on the plane. First they rub down over 10,000 square metres of bodywork. Then, after applying a very large amount of brown paper, the A380 is ready for a brand new paint job. All in all, more than half a tonne of paint and primer are needed to protect the aluminium skin from the elements. The final livery has been a closely guarded secret. Until January the 18th, when the A380 goes public for the first time. The world's press are here, and as ever with this plane, it's a big deal. Inside part of the final assembly line, seating for 5,000 guests has been installed. In the equipping hall, now full of part-built planes, TV reporters are hard at work, feeding the story to the networks. Richard Branson has grabbed the headlines with news of double beds and casinos in his planes. For John Leahy and many others, it's a welcome moment of satisfaction. It took an awful long time to get here, didn't it? But now we're here. It's pretty exciting. The heads of state and governments arrive and take their places for a spectacle featuring dry ice, flying machines and computer graphics. Despite several high-profile speakers, there's only one star of this show. Finally, the biggest airliner of all time is there for all to see. For Charles Champion and everyone else who built the plane, it's a moment to savour. Well, it's a good achievement, huh? I mean, a good show and uh, good speeches and uh, a nice aircraft. And uh, tomorrow back to work to make it fly. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. With the plane unfinished and with billions of pounds riding on its performance, the programme is about to enter the most critical phase yet. By March 2005, the Airbus A380 is being worked on at a feverish pace. The engineers simply have to get the plane finished and into the air. It's like the final climb to the peak of Everest, let's say. It, it, the last sort of 10, 20 feet when the oxygen levels are, are so small is often the most difficult, the, the most difficult part of the, of the journey. And that's essentially where we are at the moment in terms of this aircraft. Simon Sanders is in charge of testing the deployment of the landing gear, a critical safety requirement. In just 56 days' time, the pilots' lives will depend on these 22 wheels retracting and extending come what may. Altogether, the gear weighs the same as 20 family cars and must be lifted into the belly of the plane in just 13 seconds. Getting the system operational has taken months of hard work, but now it looks as if they're finally making progress. The last few months um, have been very frustrating because we've had um, obviously a lot of uh, uh, technical difficulties with systems on the aircraft, we've had a lot of problems during testing, so we've all been working very, very, very hard in order to, to have all of our systems all working um, for first flight. Hey! Woo! <laughs> so that's system one, looking good. This is why we're here. Days like today is 
is uh, why you do this job because it's very exciting to see the gears moving and you spend an awful lot of time making sure that the right parts are where they should be and so <laughs> I've been waiting for this for months. <laughs> Their last hurdle is to simulate a worst case scenario. Even if all power was lost during flight, the pilots must still be able to lower the wheels to land. In such an emergency, the gear should fall down under its own weight. But testing it is risky because the wheels will hit the doors as they drop and that could cause damage. So this is the, uh, the big test, yeah. The outer doors begin to open under their own weight. Any second now, the locks that hold the gear up will release. Immediately it's clear that something has gone wrong. Next, the massive six-wheeled main gears deploy. And after a delay of 16 seconds, the jammed outer wheels slip free. It's not a good result. We've, we've worked as hard, we've done the best we, we possibly can, and, and we are where we are at the moment. For me, it's something to get stuck into. <laughs> something to understand, something to uh, find a solution. The team suspect that the wheel might be sticking on a guide ramp, an aluminium plate where the wheel is supposed to push the door aside. Smearing it with grease should prove if this is quite literally the sticking point. The ramp does seem to be the problem. A permanent solution is needed, and fast.